reading of our scripture today is Luke 15, 1 through 3. Please stand. Now the tax collector and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then the Jesus told them this parable, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, you know, the, the three verses that Holly read this morning in our scripture is just the prelude of what our sermon is today about the three lost parables. And, of course, we know that they're the sheep, the coin, and the prodigal son. Uh, which most of us have heard maybe hundreds of thousands of sermons on the prodigal son and maybe not so much on the sheep and the coin. So that's where my focus is going to be on the main, my main part of my sermon. Um, but this morning, I want to tell you a, a prodigal son story, but it's actually my prodigal son story. And um, many years ago, our son and our two granddaughters were estranged from us. We didn't have any contact with them. And the reasons are, un, you know, it's unimportant for what reason it was. And this was about the same time that Pastor Eddie had uh, incorporated the CLMs as part of the ministry and, and teaching team. And so on September 2nd, 2007, I was scheduled to preach at this service, at the 11 o'clock service. And most of you know that now John and I go, normally we go to the 8 o'clock service and, unless I'm preaching at the 9.30 or the 11. And so as is my routine, I try to go out into the North X or into the sanctuary and, and greet people as they come in because I don't get to see the 11 o'clockers very often. So I was out in the North X and I was greeting uh, the folks out in the North X and I turned around and there at the front door stood my son and my two granddaughters and there was crying and there was hugging and um, so I, I pulled myself together and in 20 minutes I was going to be up here preaching I didn't know how I was going to do that but I said to him I said um, why did you come to the church and he said to me, he said, because I remember that you and dad always come to the 11 o'clock. Well, that in itself was a God incidence. It wasn't a coincidence. It was a God incidence that I was preaching at the 11 o'clock service that day. And he said, and it was public and safe. And I said, well, what did you think I was going to do? What did you think I was going to say? What did you think I was going to do? And he said, I didn't know, Mom, with the way I've treated you. I didn't know if you would accept me and welcome me in. So, folks, let me tell you what the prodigal son story parable is all about. There is nothing that any of us can do that God will not take us in. He will never turn his back on any of us for anything that we do. God loves us unconditionally like a mother loves her son. Amen? Amen. And after the hugs... And, and kisses and tears, folks, there will be great rejoicing. There will be a party in heaven for every time the prodigal son comes home. Amen. Let us, let us, <laughs> let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with, with humble hearts. And maybe some of us have have their own prodigal son story. So, Father, I just ask right now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing unto you because we know that you are our rock and redeemer, but we also know that you love us unconditionally. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We know over the years, all of us have lost something valuable. You know, maybe it was... Um, your grandmother's ring. Maybe it was a piece of jewelry and it was your grandmother's ring and you treasured it. Um, I have, I wear a ring all the time and it was from my favorite aunt and she was married in 1919. She was a young bride, 1919. And this was her wedding band and it's one of my prized treasures. I, I just, 
I love this ring. Or maybe it would be treasured memorabilia from your great-grandfather that fought in World War I. But more than losing, most of the time we just misplace. We misplace things. We misplace documents, important papers. We misplace our glasses, and we misplace our keys. Think about this. Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, and that was their most prized treasure. Amen? They lost Jesus. But in our scripture this morning, we're talking more about lost souls and how God rejoices every time a lost soul is found and repents. Luke 15 focuses on forgiveness, compassion, and mercy. This is the heart of Jesus' mission statement, and it is not one characteristic of a Pharisee. So in our scripture this morning that Holly read for us, it says that the religious leaders accused Jesus of um, associating and eating with tax collectors and sinners. So who were these people? Well, the tax collectors were Jews, and they were working for the Roman government, and they were collecting the tax that the, the government charged, and then they were charging exorbitant extra tax on top of that so that they could line their pockets. They were most despised by their own people because they were gouging them and stealing from them. Yet Jesus saw a glimmer of hope in men like this, such as Levi, who we know as Matthew, and Zacchaeus, who was the wee little man up in the sycamore tree. And then as the sinners were considered the lower class, they were also known as the poor, even if it had nothing to do with money. And this grouping included the orphans and the widows, the blind, the lame, the mentally ill, people that had physical and mental handicaps, and it also it included the outcasts, such as the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Jesus was offering to these folks, this lower class folks, considered lower class folks, he was offering to them the same message that he offered to the Pharisees. The kingdom of God is yours. You are included. But then in Matthew 21, Jesus says to the religious leaders, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Whoa. How do you think that went over? And then in Matthew 23, Jesus says to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and called them hypocrites at least seven times in that scripture for the way they were living and not honoring God in any way, shape, or form. They were too stiff-necked to inherit the kingdom. So Jesus associates with these people, this lower-class people, because they're the ones who will listen, they're teachable, and they will repent. The religious leaders never thought themselves as sinners, they felt that they were closer to God because they tried to follow those 613 laws and they stayed clean. They didn't interact with the people that were, so, were called the lower class. Watchman Nee was a Chinese uh, Christian leader and teacher in the early 20th century, and this is what he said. Man doesn't become a sinner. He is a sinner because of Adam. One who sins less is a moral sinner. A noble person is a noble sinner. A holy man is a holy sinner. And even though we are all have been forgiven, we are all sinners. Not one of us is righteous. Not one. We are all sinners. So when we dig deeper into our scripture this morning, we go past the three verses and we go into uh, verse 4 through 6 and we're going to talk about the, um, the lost sheep. And it says, suppose one of you had 100 sheep and loses one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And so... The lost sheep. Sheep are everywhere in Jesus' community. Every, it's, it's 
that's what they had was sheep. And all through the scriptures, you find imagery of sheep and a shepherd. And in every instance, we, you and me, and you guys, we're never the shepherd. We're always the sheep. Have you ever thought about that? We're never the shepherd. We're always the sheep. So why is this? So let me, let me tell you about what we are. Sheep are infa, infa, ooh, infamously dumb <laughs> and stubborn animals. They're easily bored and prone to wander, especially into dangerous situations. Anybody having an identity crisis yet? <laughs> they lose their footing and fall. I did that last week in my own driveway. If, you fall, if they fall on their backs, they can't get up because the blood drains from their legs and their legs go numb, so they have neuropathy. They don't have a medic alert button that they can push and they can't say, I've fallen and I can't get up. Sheep are social animals, so they need a flock. And when they get lost, they just lay down and they won't move. When I get lost, I pull the car off to the side of the road and I cry because I'm directionally challenged. And John can attest to that. I just cry. Jesus is comparing these Pharisees in their mind to one of the lowest jobs they could have, a shepherd. And I'm sure that alone was quite a kick in the gut to them because Jesus has always, already called them hypocrites, vipers, and um, stiff-necked. So he, the name-calling just keeps on going. That was a kick in the gut to them. It would be too embarrassing for a Pharisee to say he lost a sheep. So his attitude would be, let it stay lost. But our shepherd is not that way. He knows that we are valuable and worth saving. So he leaves the 99 religious leaders in the wilderness to find us one at a time. And when he does... He wraps his arms around us, and figuratively speaking, he takes us and he puts us across his shoulders to take us home, just like that picture that we see with him the, with the sheep around his neck. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? And then for the lost coin, we, we read in, in verses 8 and 9, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it and then when she finds it she calls her friends to rejoice for many of us this wouldn't seem like a big deal to lose just one coin but for a palestinian woman it was one tenth of her wedding gift and as pastor eddie said this morning and i also saw that same uh research is that it would be like 10 coins around her neck it would be like her wedding ring it would be a wedding necklace so if she lost one of those coins, that would be one-tenth of her wedding ring. It also was a day's wage, and it was half of the temple tax that she would owe. How many times have we not leaned over to pick up a penny because our attitude is, it's just a penny. It's just a penny. The woman doesn't take that lax attitude towards her lost possession. First, it says she lights a lamp. Her apartment, her house would be very small, and it was very dark in there. And if they had windows, many of them didn't, but if they had windows, they would have been very small, and not enough light could filter in that she could see. So she has to burn extra oil in order for her to see clearly. And next, she just doesn't stand there and, and go like this and say, well, I've lost it. No, she she gets her broom or she gets something and she starts sweeping her apartment until and, and reaching back into the crevices that she normally can't even have access to to try to find her coin. And then above all, she searches carefully with diligence. This coin was valuable and she must find it at all costs. Jesus doesn't take that lax attitude in seeking us out either. He must find us at all cost. The cross. He is the light of the world. And he will take us out of our darkness into his light. The lost coin represents a sinner lost in the world. 
Jesus is the only way for all of us to be saved. And he gives us just a glimpse of what is yet to come. Amen. And that is why he left glory and came to earth. And he doesn't want anyone to be left behind. Peter writes, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise about the second coming, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's the way it has to be. Repentance, confession, repentance, and then you have faith. From there, you have the faith. And that's why uh, Jesus says, every time a sinner repents, there's rejoicing in heaven. The sinner who humbles himself or herself and confesses their lost condition brings joy every time to God. Not just every once in a while, but every time it brings joy to God. So what, what can we learn from these two parables? As sinners, whether we are a sheep that has lost our way or we're a coin and we don't even know we're lost, Jesus knows both are valuable and treasured, and he will come looking for us. And as believers, we are to be his hands, his feet, and his mouthpiece as, as long as we're on earth to tell all people that they too are valued and treasured. And this is what I've come up with. This is what we need to do. We, we are to pray for those who are lost. Believers who have veered off of God's path or those who have, haven't heard the good news of Jesus Christ. We are to be the great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. And then secondly, we're to be persistent and diligent in our mission in finding the lost. We don't give up. We turn on the light. We sweep the floor. We look everywhere. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to, to visit me. Truly I tell you, whatever you have done to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it for me. And finally, we're to rejoice with heaven every time one of the lost finds Jesus through repentance. This is the season of repentance. This is the season of compassion. Jesus is all about love and compassion. But I want you to know this. If there had only been one person on earth, Jesus would still have gone to the cross so that he or she could have eternal life. Amen? Matt Chandler, a pastor from Flower Mount, Texas, tells this story about a man named Dave Carnes. Dave was a 23-year uh, active-duty Marine veteran and now is a, an accountant in uh, Connecticut. And on 9-11, that horrible day, Dave was in his office and he was watching what was happening as we were glued to our television sets and we were watching as those planes went into the north and the south towers. Dave couldn't just sit there and think about it and say, oh my goodness, I'm going to pray for them. He went to his boss and he said, I don't know when I'll be back. I'm going to be gone for a while. And he went home, and he put on his fatigues, and he drove 120 miles an hour to get to ground zero, and he was there in the late afternoon. 3,000 people died that day, and only 20 survived that had been buried under the rubble of the towers. Two of those men was Will Hamino and John McCoughlin, Port Authority agents who had been on the bottom floor of the South Tower when the tower collapsed. Because of his uniform and the clout and the credentials of his uniform, Dave was allowed to go into ground zero. He wasn't turned away. And he went in search and he found another Marine. And the two of them 
started searching through the rubble for an hour when they finally heard tapping on a metal pipe. Nine hours without food, water, and breathing in that toxic, deadly smoke, Will and John were number 18 and 19 that had been rescued. All because Dave took off his suit, put on his rescue fatigues, rolled up his sleeves, and stepped into the despair and darkness of ground zero. Then Pastor Chandler writes, in the same way, but an infinitely greater degree, God took off his royal robes, stepped into our dark and depraved culture, and served us. We were buried in the depths and rubble of our own foolishness with zero chance of pulling ourselves out of our own sin. We were without hope until the Holy One clothed himself in humanity to rescue us, to become sin for us on the cross. Our service to others must be grounded in the truth of the gospel, Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection for us. It begins and ends with Jesus. Begins there because he is our original motivation and ends there because in him we are empowered to serve and to save others. Amen, and let us pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. O oh Lord, keep us from being a Pharisee. If we are a sheep or a coin or a prodigal, there is hope for us. Thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray and may all the believers say, Amen. Amen.